I'm Jonathan. I'm you what? Thanks for, for staying and not going and staring at the pizza. So uh, we're going to present um, today. It's, it's uh, very intimidating to present to this audience because you've all been on longer, more complicated, and challenging trips than we have. And we were not even supposed to be the speakers. Uh, something went wrong and we're the last minute stand in. And we figured that they'll never let us up on the stage again. So we're just going to go for it. And since we want to impress you, we decided to put all three of our expeditions together into one presentation to impress you with quantity and you. And we'll uh, give you a quick overview of each trip and then talk about what lessons we have learned. Uh, and at the end, there should be room for questions and critique. Uh, so you can point out all the mistakes. And um, there will be pretty pictures. And of course, rain their cheese and whiskey. <laughs> all right. So here we are. Uh, you know Jonathan Luskin, um, former vice president and former president of Basque. Uh, and I'm the guy in the middle. And we met at the Skills Clinic in 2010 and have been on a lot of trips together since then. But on these three trips, we also uh, brought this guy who you probably don't know over there. Um, he is my oldest brother. His name is Christian. And he is uh, mostly harmless. <laughs> I, I should be in the middle of the picture because I stood between the two brothers and saw the streets. <laughs> So we have this cool uh, Google Earth thing going on. Um, this is our, our first trip, oh no, first, our trip to Haida Gwaii. So that's Haida Gwaii, um, which is off the coast of Canada. It's about 30 to 75 miles, depending on where you measure. Um, Vancouver is actually going to be the other place. Yeah. Uh, Vancouver is down there. Um, My, uh, John, a little louder. Oh, sorry. Yeah, hold the mic. Vancouver is down there. <laughs> Sorry, um, I'm trying to control all this stuff all at once. Um, so up there, that's um, a sand spit where you land in an airplane. You get there as one plane a day, don't miss it uh, if the weather is bad. Down at the bottom is um, Guayanas, which is the beautiful place where um, the UNESCO World Heritage Site is, and that's where you go paddling. So we, uh, we flew here to sand spit. And we took a road, uh, a van down a crazy logging road with bears and logging trucks. And then we took a, a speedboat, you'll see, that was you know, like 35 knots in over 40 degree water. It's the coldest ride ever. Um, and we landed down here. We started in the south because um, sort of the prevailing wind goes north and uh, the flood goes north. Um, there's a lot of currents through all these, there's a lot of currents through all these islands and stuff. Um, and when we get to the end, I'll just show you. We can stop and see what our trip was. Come on, there. And yeah, there. Okay. So um, most of the trip was inside the islands, but then there's some uh, really interesting outside here. This is the Hecate Strait, and it has weather. It has stuff. It has weather. Yeah, it's got weather. Um, so we went in a van. It was COVID. That will come up later in our story. Um, there we are getting dropped off, and uh, there's beautiful campsites. The whole place is verdant beyond belief. There's stuff growing everywhere, deep, thick. It's pretty nuts. Um, great campsites. And um, of course, you know, it's the height of people took the place over in 2010 and renamed it from the colonial name to Queen Charlotte Islands. And this is what it looked like in the end of the 19th century. That's what it looks like now. Um, not so much. Uh, there are still, um, these are you know, totem poles, which are um, memorials to the people who passed away. And they're really cool. And there's these watchmen who are Haida people who guard the sites and they give you tours. And they're really nice. Um, a lot of the inside passages look like this. There's lots, it's calm and uh, lots of growth. Uh, we, we actually watched a bear eating, you know, like 20 feet away from us, just on the shore, and you're in your boat. Um, that's on the outside. You know, and later this day, it was not calm like that at all. Um, beautiful campsites, uh, you know, with like driftwood and stuff. 
It was June and there was still snow on the mountains. It's got really high mountains. There's almost no trails on the interior. It's really thick, difficult land to walk across. Um, there's really big tides, like 23 feet. So um, there's a huge amount of wildlife of life that grows along the edge there. And there's fog, which will also come in later in our story. Um, nice inlets and great place to camp. You just look at your tent. And just Beautiful, all sorts of stuff to look at on the beach, just um, and underwater, just you know, just life everywhere you see it. I've never been to a place. <laughs> um, that's when when you're tired. The amazing thing is this one island, and it's called Hot Springs Island, and you can sit on hot springs. Yeah, it's pretty great. And so you can just sit there with your toes up and, and all that. It's very cool. Um, and you want to see and this, yeah, this was our second trip uh, to Norway, or our first trip to Norway, about our second trip together. And uh, let's see, let's get that started. So, for those of you uh, who need a little bit of a brush up on your, oh, uh, your geography of Scandinavia, oh, shoot. <laughs> <laughs> you pause it, yeah, you just pause it at the. So, uh, yeah, we call this the Scandinavian lion. You have the... Ah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll just have to talk about it. So you got the tail and the hind legs, that's Finland. The body in the middle is Sweden, and then you have Norway up here. We went to this area, it's just south of Lofoten. Some of you may have heard of that. So. This is the area we paddled in, and it was very, very calm when we were there. We could have paddled pretty much anywhere further out or further in. It's a great place where you can, you know, if you have, <laughs> if you have bad weather, uh, yeah, let's go here. So about half of our trip was above the Arctic Circle, and half of it was below. This uh, symbol up there is supposed to be right at the uh, Arctic Circle, which it is not, uh, <laughs> but we were happy about it anyways. Um, so a lot of the islands there are granite that have been shaped by many, many ice ages and just scraped down to these very smooth little hills and for some geological reason, I don't know, there are also these uh, impressive mountains on some of the islands. Um, the snow out there is over by Svartisen, which is uh, the black ice, the biggest uh, glacier in Norway. Some of the bigger islands uh, have inhabitants on them, and that's a great place to get water. There wasn't a whole lot of water on the islands themselves. This is my brother going to get water, and that's Jonathan there. And also, in these places, there's usually a place to grab some food and a beer. Uh, and we did that as much as we could. Uh, as I said, it was really, really calm, and um, having beaches to land on was really uncommon. So finding a good place to camp uh, was not a problem because a lot of the islands are flat and they have a little grass on them. Most of these islands are grazed by sheep. Uh, but finding a good place to land was difficult, and I think Christian found a... Uh, he, he found some information like on a blog or something about places where you could land and there's no guidebook for this area. Um, yeah, beautiful meadows and uh, great camps. Oh, those are the sheep. In some areas, very surprisingly different, this looks almost tropical. Uh, vast areas, really shallow water and uh, white sand beaches and uh, impossible to navigate because you'll have a small area with a thousand small islands and sometimes they're one island and sometimes they're two islands depending on what the tide is doing and they all look the same from the vantage point of the kayak. Um, yeah, we didn't see a whole lot of wildlife. I guess they ate all the whales, but uh, they haven't eaten the puffins yet, so we saw some puffins. I was happy about that. Uh, this is the island Röderöja and we uh, took a day off and paddled over there for some hiking, uh, and it was a long hike, but it was well worth it. Beautiful views uh, up there. Um, so you can actually 
see most of the area we paddled and we visited many of these islands out there. It was, it was really a really nice spot. And we saw a lot of these circles. They're about 100 foot in diameter. And uh, if you ever buy salmon, uh, Atlantic salmon, they're grown in those circles, uh, which is less environmentally sound than the Alaska system. And, uh, June? June -ish, yeah, June. Um, let's, let's get this going. And then our, our last trip we're going to talk about is Alaska Prince William Sound, which probably some of you have been there. Um, that's Prince William Sound area, that yellow thing there. And so we went to Whittier and um, we got dropped off here at the top of Colross Island. There you can see on that thing there, um, up there. We, we had to change our plan. Um, we had to stay inside for three days during a lot of storms, and then we uh, and then we went down to the glaciers. Um, our ride to our put-in was pretty exciting. And that beach was disappearing as the tide went up, and they, they dropped us in the rain. It was like a race to get packed and to get on the water. Um, it was uh, a time of year when all the salmon come back, so all the bears were at lunch all the day, all day. And this one was underwater. It's crazy. It's really nuts. There's, there's salmon everywhere. Get the salmon on the beaches. Um, there was, there was a lot of calm, too, um, along with other stuff. Water everywhere. Water is no problem to, to get in Alaska. This is really fun. So we went and visited the Neliwan Glacier, and it's a glacier that um, it, uh, it retreated. And when it retreated, it left the glacial moraine. And so there's this giant bay with one little outlet. So the tide goes in and out. There's lots of current. So all the little bergy bits come flying down the current. It's like a video game. You, Paddle up, and you're just like dodging all the little burgy bits, which is a lot of fun, um, actually. I don't think so. We we stayed, you know, a good mile away from the real big stuff, which is at the end of here. Um, and you can see the um, the people who have done the global warming hoax have done a great job of making the cliffs look like the glacier went down there. You can see that. There. <laughs> but um, really, the glaciers used to be up there, but now they're down there, and so. That's a thing. Um, there's snow mountains, you know, snowy mountains even in the summer, and fog. And um, this is an interesting uh, time lapse because if it's foggy, kind of like Bay Area, a lot of times it'll burn off after a time. You can see the tide going up and up and up and up, and eventually that day, the sun came out, and that was nice. Yeah, that's nice. It's cold. Um, whoops. And uh, just, you know, really stunning landscape, which is a lot of fun. Um, and now we'll talk about planning. Yes. That's it for the trip. So uh, we'll see if we learned anything from all this paddling. But um, yeah, what you see here is pretty uncommon for us. My brother lives in Sweden, and uh, we hardly ever got the chance to get together to plan these trips, so a lot of the planning happened uh, over Skype before Zoom existed. And we found quickly that um, it was important that we all had the same information uh, in the same format, because it was just so hard to talk about um, what was going on without looking at the same thing. So that goes for maps, charts, chart keys, timetables, safety information. We, that was the first thing we did for all these trips. We just made sure that we had the same maps and charts. Uh, it helps with communication about route position and all that, both on and off the water. And it's good to have duplicates of that stuff if some is lost. And even though we have uh, thick charts and maps that Jonathan will talk about later, we uh, also always make sure that we had a bigger overview uh, chart, which is really helpful when you change your plans and you want to see uh, what's going on. So. We always had that as well with us. Um, 
yeah, some good things to mark on charts and maps. Places to land, that was particularly important in uh, Alaska, I would say, and Hyatt White too, I guess. The, there are some good campgrounds, but you, they're hard to find sometimes. Uh, places to camp, yep. Yeah. Uh, water access, that was not so much an uh, issue in Hyatt and Alaska, but it certainly was a big issue in Norway. And uh, yeah, challenging areas and sites to see. So when we planned our trip to Haida Gwaii, we were given some uh, charts that I think Penny had used on her trip in the early 90s uh, to Haida Gwaii. I think that was right when that park opened, if I'm not mistaken. And she had also marked her charts. Um, she had written paddle or die um, <laughs> in this area. <laughs> Just north of there, there was another note that said uh, paddle and pray. And it turned out that that was sound advice. This is the only chart that we have ever seen where there was actually waves printed on the chart. <laughs> Which, yeah. Um, and, and also, a four not current going both ways there. Um, they, this was this is Point Benjamin, and um, we had to paddle about two or three hours any hopping to get there at Slack. Um, and it was, a, it was the only challenging part of Hyde Park. It was really challenging. We're out there, it's four to five foot waves, 40 degree water, burying our bowels. And after we got through that, you and I compared our, same, our notes, and we didn't feel panicked and we didn't feel scared because we thought, you know, we've done this. We've been in Yellow Bluff, we've been in Point Bonita, we've been to Mendocino, we've gone from Angel Island on a, winter, on a summer afternoon when it's howling. So the vast experience of mass training was just so crucial to keep our state of mind calm in that situation. Uh, the the Rocky Shore, you can't land there for miles. It was a tough time. Wow. Yes. Um, let's see. More planning stuff. Let's see. Yeah, so we always made, always made sure to have a fall forward plan. Um, that in Norway, for instance, we had really calm weather, so we could uh, do longer crossings and visit islands that were further out than we had initially planned. And fall backward plan, uh, we've actually never paddled the uh, original plan. We just, <laughs> <laughs> we, yeah, so it's important to be flexible, I guess. Um, yes, consider finding places where you can camp for several days. Uh, it's nice not to have to break down your camp every single day. We have done that many times. And uh, yeah, leave room for the unexpected, such as this text that we received from my brother the day before we were leaving for Haida Gwaii. Uh, his luggage didn't make it from um, Scandinavia. And we quickly had to cobble together all the gear for him. So my brother is a very exacting person, and he probably started packing in January, testing out different gloves, and different booties, just to have it just so. And uh, then in the end, his little brother had to borrow uh, long johns from my wife and all that for him to wear. So it worked out, uh, but it was a bit of a surprise. So I'm just going to talk a bit about navigation. Um, we've, we've had um, all sorts of different charts in our different things. I think we got it right now. So um, we talked about large paper charts. I really like 8 and a half by 11 or 8 and a half by 10. Um, small charts, not the 11 by 17. I like theirs. They, they fit better on my deck. And so we, um, the example I'll give here is from Heidi Gwaii. We ended up with double-sided laminated charts with a topo map, topographic map on one side and the same a navigation chart on the other side, the known chart. Um, you can use a China marker, of course, to write on the lamination, and you should always have charts outside your planned trip, because we've never done the trip we planned. If you're in America, whoops, whoops you can use uh, the NOAA custom chart thing, which is fairly new, um, and uh, you can just search for NOAA custom chart, and you can make your own charts. And you get charts like that for, you know, in the bay, but if you look at Haida Gwaii, which is in Canada, which is not supported by the U.S. government to make charts for, you get this cartoon chart. And, um, so that, that wasn't going to help us. So we went, we went to QGIS. And uh, you know, Joe Berkowitz gave a, a seminar on QGIS, which is an open source data visualization tool. It is way, way beyond our needs. Um, 
And on the our Bass YouTube channel, there's a tutorial on that, but I couldn't have done what I'm going to show you without some personal uh, intervention by Joe. Uh, Q, uh, QGIS is really, really deep uh, software, and I've worked with computers and software my whole life, and I found it really challenging. I mean, it's just got rows and rows of features, and everything you want to do, you have to go find a plugin and put it in and learn how to use the plugin. Um, but what you get to make if you, if you go through that is, here's a chart, I put magnetic lines on it, so I never had to walk a course over a compass row, so I had a magnetic line right there next to me, which is really cool. Um, I made a, so Chris Lewis gave me all her Garmin data from her Heidi Watt trip, which had all sorts of interesting stuff like where the bears are and, um, and you know, where the, the Morse the explorers is the people who gave us a ride and boat. And so I made this, um, this key of what I was going to do, and then I found the right plugins and I imported, and then I ended up with the charts that looked like that, and here's all these symbols, which is really cool, and that was really helpful. Um, and then you can make an atlas. So every one of our charts has a number, and the number's on the atlas. And for the day, I'd say like, oh, you know, we, we need 18, 19, and 21. Put those on my deck. Yeah. And then the other ones are in the hatch. Um, so that was just really cool. So yeah, that's, you know, the, the uh, marine chart, and there's the um, top of the map and of the same area. And they give you lots of information. Now I'm going to, this is my, my ode to compasses. Um, compasses are so good, and um, I use a clip-on one, which lets me put it anywhere on my deck I want, close enough to wipe the spray off it, close enough to energize it to glow at night with a flashlight, and um, close enough to see if we don't need focus. Um, so, a lot of bass paddles, you know, if, if this was a bass paddle, we'd be having conversations like, you see the bump on the right that's to the left, and two bumps to the left, but, but not as big as the bump to the far right? <laughs> and, and it's just a lot of miscommunication and confusion. But if you could just say, you know, I'm looking at 120 degrees at that bump, and everyone has a compass, it's really great. Um, the, the other um, good thing about it is, a lot of times I've been on a bass paddle and you're like going from Red Rock and you're crossing the channel and there's a lot of ebb current and you want to cross in the most efficient, quick way. And someone wants to say, go towards that landmark, which doesn't work, right? Because the current's going this way and you're going like, you know, like that. You're turning towards the landmark as you're going downstream. You really want a compass course for that. So it, it's just, you know, they don't use batteries and they're on all the time and they're right there. They're really great. Also, this is from Haida Gwaii. That fog there, we were doing a crossing between two islands. We didn't have a course. We were just like, there's the island. We'll just go paddle there. And 10 minutes later, and I'm not exaggerating, it was like, wow. <laughs> so I mean, it just came roaring in. So the last minute before we lost sight of the island, I took the compass bearing, and then we just followed that. So I love compasses. Um, Heidi Gwaii had big tides. That there is seven meters. So this is 23 feet. Um, which looks kind of like that. Those are our kayaks. That's one. And we were exploring, looking for a campsite. This was an interesting area because there were tidal wars that came down through here. Um, sometimes we had to lift our kayaks up away from the shore. And um, this is what happens when you make a mistake. <laughs> okay? So we were looking for a certain beach, and we were, I don't know, we just done a crossing, so we were maybe a little impatient. We said, that's the beach, and we were so totally wrong. This is about a foot deep of organic living creatures and stuff, and that's the beach we thought we were going to. And we actually carried one of our kayaks up there before, you know, I was on the VHF radio with the watchman who was running this island, and uh, he was like, where are you? And I blew my whistle. He goes, there's no way to be from where you are. Like, you can't walk here. So we had to actually bring our boat back and then paddle some more and find the correct beach. Just a warning to be more careful. OK. So communication. Um, we have used different devices on all our different trips. On our most recent trip, we used a uh, Garmin inReach, which is that thing there. Not very thing. Uh, yeah. So practice with your device before you leave. My uh, daughter decided to uh, run around Mount Rainier uh, in three days. That's a hundred mile trip, uh, 20,000 plus elevation gain. And she got lost on the second day. 
her friend had a garment uh, in reach with her, and uh, her friend's father and I were in camp waiting for them. We also had a garment in reach, and uh, we both sent messages to each other that we didn't receive because we didn't know how to use the devices. So uh, that wasn't so good. Luckily, it ended well, but I was <laughs> really scared for a long time. Uh, yeah, make sure that everyone in your group uh, knows how to use it. Uh, that's also important. And yeah, be familiar with battery usage and have a plan for how to recharge. I have this big battery pack uh, that you can actually charge with those little solar cells. Uh, it works pretty well, and that's all we brought for all our electronic devices. Uh, and this is a big one. Be clear with those at home what your communication expectations are from them and to them. So I paddled with my brother, just the two of us, in the archipelago of Stockholm for a week, and he had a spot. Uh, I don't know if you remember those devices. They were early uh, GPS devices. And um, we could send a message, uh, and he had told uh, our wives that we would send one at lunchtime and then one when we stopped for the day, and that worked great. So we thought, well, we'll just do the same when we go to Hyderabad. But in Hyderabad, with those tides, everything, you just have to paddle when you can, basically, because the currents are so strong. So sometimes we didn't start paddling until 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and we may stop at 8 or so. So, you know, lunch and evening uh, becomes difficult. Uh, on two trips, we think we've sent messages, but they were never received, so that made people concerned at home. Uh, you know, they're not perfect, these devices. Um, we also uh, made clear to everybody at home that we didn't want to uh, hear from them <laughs> unless, <laughs> unless something really bad happened. <laughs> uh, you know, it really takes away from uh, the nature immersion to have somebody ask you, how's it going? And then, you know, you don't want to sit there and text on the little uh, in reach. Uh, so communication became uh, particularly important because my poor brother uh, tested positive for COVID on the second day of the trip. Uh, so there was a lot of communication with um, yeah, his wife and, and uh, outfitters and they ended up picking him up and then he ended up coming back at the tail end of the trip and it was a big mess. And uh, this is Jonathan towing him across. He was so weak, the poor guy, that he couldn't really paddled very fast and we were in a hurry to get back before the, the cards picked up. Gear. Is that us? Yeah? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, I've heard those IKEA bags called International Kayak Expedition Accessories. Uh, two things. Uh, Jonathan pointed out that it's really helpful to mark them so you know what bag is what. That's really useful. Uh, Jonathan also brought a couple of zippered ones, uh, and we found them great for uh, when we put things up in the trees, the bear, bear hangs, um, because um, it keeps rain out pretty well and keeps the smaller critters away, uh, mice and birds and stuff like that. Ah, oh, the amazing bear hang. So we have always suffered with the bear hang um, my whole life. <laughs> I just, it's never really worked very well for me. It's been, yeah, just problematic. And so before we went to Heidegwai, we uh, looked on YouTube to find the best possible system. And we found a great system. And the main part of that system was that, if I may borrow you, Jonathan is the tree trunk here. This is the limb, and usually, you know, you would throw something over here to keep the bags away from the tree trunk so the bear can climb up the tree trunk and grab the bags. The problem with that is that it's really weak there, especially in Arctic areas where a lot of the trees have branches that are sloping down because of the snow load. So um, what this guy suggested was that you put the rope or close to the trunk and then you pull the bag out, and that's what you see here. Um, so this rope, I don't know if you can see that, but it goes up close to the tree and then we pull the bag away with this, with the same rope. So, yeah, 
we didn't have the bare stuff that my brother prepared, so I just threw these uh, things together. Um, I happened to have a bag with a couple of carabiners, and um, it turned out to be an amazing system. And uh, what we liked about it was that it only uses one rope, and um, it, it's a pulley system, so it's a mechanical advantage. It's three times lighter to pull things up, and there's a lot of weight to pull up in the beginning of a trip, probably close to 80 pounds, or I don't know. It's you know food for three guys for 10 plus days, and then all the toiletries and all that. And um, you don't pull on the rope when it's loaded. That's the rope is fixed, so you don't wear down the branch or the rope. It's all in the pulley system. That's really nice. And um, once it's installed, it's very easy to lower and raise the bags because it seemed like pretty much every night you forget your toothbrush or you know there's a, like a bar left in your life jacket or something. So I, I think we have committed to making a video on how to do this bearing. So we'll do that at some point. Hi. Another. Another great thing about this, it's using a, real, a fairly thick rope, which is really great on your hands, not some super thin line that destroys your hands. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so is there a loop and a pulley at the middle of that rope, or the, where the bag is now? Yeah, so in that picture, you can't see the pulley system, but it's all, it's all in there when it's contracted. Yeah. Um, so because we Work. We don't have time to drive to these locations, like to drive to Alaska or to drive to Heidegger. So we have to rent kayaks, which is just a really mixed experience if you've rented. Um, so this is in Alaska. These are Prejean Kodiaks, which are kind of like Volvos. They're really good. Um, they got gigantic hatches and they're plastic. Um, this was in Norway where the kayaks sucked. Um, that's actually, this one we brought on a car um, that belongs to Christian, but these were like some kind of weird dog kayaks. It didn't really work very well. Um, <laughs> and uh, in, in Hyderabad, we lucked out again. We had a sewer tiny so composite boat. It's really great, really easy to load, wonderful kayaks. So just, um, I don't know, interrogate your outfitter. <laughs> um, so tents were an issue. I, I, they, I'm talking about this because my, my paddle mates made a lot of fun of me about my tents. I, I, for the first two trips, I took this, you know, a backpacking tent like we often have. Um, and this is what happened in a storm in Norway. Those are my feet. I'm holding the tent up with my feet because it's, we're just being beat to death there. Um, and, you know, the pups in the morning, so there's my, you know, um, that's supposed to be straight. <laughs> so the other thing about a tent like that is that um, I was in Alaska and I realized if you have a tent which is typically has an inner tent that's not waterproof and has maybe mosquito netting, and then an outer tent which is waterproof, you can't set it up in the rain without getting wet unless you try to set up the outer fly first and then sneak the tent underneath, which can be impossible or really hard. So um, later I got this tent which has some great features. Um, look at the guy lines, got six of these double guy lines. Um, it, the outer fly is bungee sort of attached to the inner part, so when you set it up, it's already waterproof. Um, and that was, and my paddle mates stopped making fun of me, so that was good too. Yeah. Oh, right, <laughs> so on the last trip, of course, um, the tents were uh, in the airplane lost, you know, somewhere. So we had to go and, um, ironically, Christian had to use my old tent, which he <laughs> might touch on that. So that was good. Yes, tarps. So uh, we have brought three tarps. Um, one ground tarp for putting out gear on, uh, just like that. Uh, it's really nice when it's wet in the ground and you want to change and you know, not have your gear get all muddy and wet. Um, and then we have two of these tarps. Um, it's a 10 by 10 lightweight tarp. We usually use paddles and then we bring two um, poles with us to hold it up. Um, you know, in a lot of places like uh, Alaska and Haidekwai, we could just use trees like here. Um, in this picture, 
uh, it was raining and uh, it was nice to have a cover just as you come out of the tent. The other one uh, we use for the kitchen, and the kitchen in, in bear country is you know 300 feet away or so. And then we used it for uh, just you know at lunchtime. It was nice to get a little break from the wind and uh, tuck in under uh, tarps. So we use the tarps all the time. And Uh, uh, no, we use Hildeberg, which is, uh, yeah. Because he's Swedish, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, this is a, a little um, call out to my, my wonderful boots. These are $14 Walmart boots. Um, the, the key thing here is they are completely 100% waterproof. This is rubber. It does not breathe at all. But that's actually a good thing. After three days of rain, I'm not sure that Gore-Tex boots are going to stay waterproof. And also, you can like walk right into the water and do the dishes with these and stuff. And you can even roll down the tops. And I climbed um, that mountain in Sweden, or Norway, with you know those boots. So they're actually like hiking boots. That's really cool. Um, yeah, gravity water filter. Uh, just get one. They're, the, they're absolutely amazing. You'll never go back to pumping water or treating with tablets or anything. Uh, we really like ours. You just fill, fill this bag up. Uh, it's open on the top. And then the filter's here, and you put the bag that you're filling below it. And it takes about five minutes to do five liters. So a liter a minute, it's pretty quick. Super, super helpful. Oh, got more. Yes, uh, we have a full kitchen with pots and pans, one burner, and we also bring a jet boil. Um, it's great in the morning when I need to make sure that my brother and Jonathan gets coffee in them as soon as possible. Um, so my brother can cook breakfast while uh, I just heat up water. Um, we also stop for warm lunch, which is really nice. Uh, and then it's nice to have the jet boil to just pull it out, heat up the water, dump it into the pouches of uh, freeze-dried food, and off we go. So it's quick, there's no dishes, and just really useful. Now, just say, I was skeptical of cooking lunch at the beginning, but after, you know, a lot of times late in the afternoon, and you're going to that campsite that's on your chart, and it's not there, and you have to do another hour and another hour in this, you know, thing inside. It's really great to have a warm lunch and have the energy um, of food. So we'll end with the most important part, food. Uh, this is probably some of the, yeah, <laughs> some culture shock here for uh, Jonathan coming to Sweden. So that's Jonathan uh, drinking beaver gall schnapps, uh, which is usually reserved for uh, the person that shoots the first moose of the hunting season. Uh, but they made an exception for Jonathan. Uh, it looks like they made several exceptions. <laughs> so, um, yeah, and this is me eating a Swedish pizza with steak and bernet sauce. And, um, yeah, we've had, we've actually tried to make one. Yeah. Anyways, uh, so, let's see. Oh, it, we'll get there, we'll get there. So this is, um, the truth is that Jonathan and I are not very good at um, camping food. So usually what happens when we plan the trip, which would be um, the trips in North America, is that we eat a lot of freeze-dried food. We try to get it in bulk. We always repack it in uh, these uh, vacuum-sealed bags. And then we just write right on top of them how much um, water they need. Uh, it's pretty light, it doesn't take a lot of space, and uh, we find that that's the best place to keep the food. Um, but my brother, he is the genius, really, when it comes to cooking in the outdoors. Uh, in Sweden, it's pretty common with savory things in tubes. <laughs> I sure. uh, this is a smoked reindeer cheese. It's not uh, milk from reindeer, it's probably cow's milk with chopped up smoked reindeer inside of it. And if you mix that with uh, pasta and rehydrated um, tomatoes, it becomes this amazingly delicious dish. 
So if my brother is a cook, I am the bartender, and we allow ourselves 7.5 centiliters of uh, alcohol per day. That comes to uh, uh, one bottle each for uh, 10 days. And we always have a uh, single malt whiskey, which is Jonathan's favorite. And we always have a mixed drink, which is my favorite. And this doesn't show the port, but uh, we all always have a port for my brother. And uh, it's, you know, we fly with this stuff, and it's really important that all your camping gear uh, doesn't smell like single malt whiskey. Uh, <laughs> so we try to pack them pretty well. I found that the best way to do that is to get uh, one liter uh, water bottles. I don't get the flimsiest kind. I get you know slightly thicker. Uh, smooth, I put packing tape around them. I find that the creases uh, get less sharp and better if you just wrap them with packing tape. And then I fill them up and then I squeeze out the air uh, and that's a great way of traveling, uh, traveling with alcohol, I find. <laughs> and if you're lucky, you can use glacial ice for your uh, evening nightcap. <laughs> and I think that's all we had. I think we have like, thank you. I think we have maybe five minutes for seven minutes for questions. Any questions? Or you're all dying to get a pizza. Do you persist the beer? Do you use the names and stuff? Do you use your cards? Do you like cards and stuff? We can use cards. We'll post on cards. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Sure. Uh, no, no, that's you have a question? Yeah. Um, do you burn trash or do you pack it out? We pack it out. Yeah. I don't know that. Yeah, we never burned anything. No. Yeah, we pack everything out. Um, Christian has this school dry bag that um, takes a liner of a plastic bag and has kind of a clamping system on the top, so it's sort of a dry garbage bag that works pretty well. Do you bring an electric fence in Moscow or not? Because of bears? Yeah. Oh. The bears were having lunch all day because <laughs> it was salmon running season. We didn't actually see bears in Alaska. There was just like these um, killing fields of salmon carcasses by the, by the, <laughs> where the bears had just been eating all the time. Um, we're really careful with our food, and um, Chris is smiling because I know she's had a lot of bear encounters. <laughs> um, well, I remember. Uh, I remember us talking about the possibilities of doing that, and it just seemed like, you know, there's a lot of fur on the bear. That it, I, I, didn't, I don't know how it would work, really. It seemed like they could just walk straight through that. I may be wrong, but... And has anyone used an electric fence to defend against bears? I did once. Oh, how'd it work out? Never had a problem. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it was raining all the time, so... Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's an idea. I know somebody who you uses... You didn't have a problem with a bear. Yeah. 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 <laughs> did you did you carry bear spray? Uh, you can, so um, not in Heidi Why they really didn't want us to do that, and they also didn't want us to use bear canisters. I can't remember the rationale; it didn't make any sense. They were like, no bear canisters, maybe ten minutes. I remember a very funny incident where I was with a little group of people. We stopped at a beach. Um, the group was at one end, and I walked down a little bit and went back. And when I came out of the bushes, the group was all gathered together, and there was a bear at the other end of the beach. And I turned and I looked at the bear, and I went, shoo! And it turned around and ran away. <laughs> <laughs> See, I'll just bring Penny instead of electric pants. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, we haven't had trouble with bears, but you know, they're all there. We're just really careful, I guess. I know somebody uses proximity alarms around their tent. That's another way to do it. Critter hitter. Called critter hitters. Critter hitters. Yeah, when you're, they're, they're activated by emotion. Okay. Yeah. 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 That's good. Anybody else? Anybody else? Bear tips. Can you talk about the times of year and how you decide when to go to the expeditions? Well, uh, the Norwegian Sea freezes over a couple of kilometers out, so there's that. Um, 
yeah, summer is the only time to go to any of these places, really. Yeah. Um, it's a pretty short window. We really lucked out with Heidegwai. We, we could have, we didn't really plan it, it just happened. It turns out that when we went, it was just a week or so before uh, they started having commercial groups there. So we hardly saw anybody else out there. We had the whole place to ourselves. And um, they, they, all these places are far north, so it's really cool to be there in June. I mean, um, in, in uh, you know, uh, Norway, we would wake up at 3 in the morning super hot because the sun is blazing down on your tent. Wow. And um, it, it also makes planning really easy. You don't have to worry about being caught at dark because there was almost no dark. There was no dark. You just paddle. It was really great. So I recommend that to you. Did you guys uh, see any northern lights on any of those trips? It's not dark. Gotta go to Winchin for that, I guess. Yeah. Uh, I just want to commend you for the instructional value of this presentation. Yes. Yes. That, thank you. The, the, you know, we talked about this on our trip. We were um, taking notes, you know, taking notes, what are we going to do better next time? And we thought about it. And we said, we don't want to just do a, a travel log and we'll just give you a little flavor and then talk about what we learned. And, you know, and then we, you know, let's discuss it on parents. We can keep talking about it here. I think we should probably wrap it up for Tom. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Thank you.